All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to the Studio Q Live Show again. It's another Saturday. Thank you for coming in. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and I think I've got some good stuff for you guys today. Um, I see there's 19 people in here already. That's that's so cool. And we it's not even 10 o'clock here in Denver yet. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Tim and John. Hey, good to see you, John. Welcome, uh, both Peters. Uh, good evening, Peter Thell. And Kurt, good to see you, Kurt. <clears throat> I love it. I always say I appreciate you guys coming in and spending your time with me. There's a billion other things you could be doing, and uh, you choose to come here. That's awesome. I'm honored. I greatly appreciate that. Um, and I think today you're going to find uh, some good stuff here. I'm going to share some really uh, interesting wet collodion negative making ideas and processes. Look at that. You can see my uh, my sheen from my negative, uh, my, my board over here. We're going to talk about here in a minute. But um so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hey, Michael, good to see you. Uh, G. McGee, good morning, good morning, Mr. Adam Ramsey, Samuel, everybody's in here. That's so cool. I Man, that is so cool. I appreciate that. Um, it's a beautiful morning here in the Denver, Colorado metro area. Uh, sunny today. Uh, we're going to hit um, about uh, 16 or 17 degrees today Celsius. Um, we're going to be up to 21 degrees Celsius tomorrow and sunny. What a great day. I just cannot wait. Um, it's, it's just beautiful. I can't wait to get out there this morning and take a little walk after this show. So it's a big, uh, big misnomer that uh, Colorado is always snowy and cold. But come Monday, it will be snowy and cold. So there's always the trade-off there. So Good morning, Pat. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Linda from Sweden. Welcome in April. Nice to see you again. I appreciate your your time coming in here. So uh, let's get the formalities out of the way. There was a couple of uh, I had a couple of uh, questions come in this week. Uh, one about cleaning. I think Michael, uh, Mr. Lopez, asked about cleaning plates. Um, we're actually going to cover that in here as I as I talk about negatives. And um, Tim Fry, missed my, my friend Tim there, he's going to, uh, he, he queried about uh, densities and different things, and we're going to definitely cover that. So if you don't have my book, I encourage you to, if you can, to grab a copy of this, my new Chemical Pictures book. I have, a, <clears throat> I still have a few left. I'm probably always saying that, right? I still have a few left. Um, we're going to work, if you do have the book, we're going to be working from chapter 11 today. It's uh, page 131, and we'll go all the way through. Uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go at least eight or 10 pages in. Um, I'm just going to refer to that. If you don't have the book, that's fine. You're still going to get a lot out of this. It's just that I refer to this book um, just simply because it makes my life easier, and I don't have to remember everything um, off the top of my head. So, and then also I posted, if you look in the chat, I posted a link to my storage on my website. That is a wonderful article from the late 90s about um, percentages of bromide, bromides and iodides in making collodion, uh, wet collodion negatives. And also it addresses um, redevelopment. Uh, with metal, a, a different type of redevelopment you can try if you'd like. It's it, the link is there in my um, in, in the chat. <clears throat> hey, Jeff East, good to see you, brother. Good uh, from Virginia. Well, you moved out of uh, Colorado, huh? That's all right. Good afternoon, Joshua from North Carolina. Oh, Dad, good morning. Good morning. Ac absolutely great. Uh, good afternoon. Yes. <clears throat> Of course, I didn't bring it with me on vacation. That's okay. You don't. You, you, I'm just saying, if you have it, great. If you don't, um, you, I'm just. I can't go into all of it in the video, but I will skim, and you can if you have the book, page 131 through about 138 is what we're going to cover today. And I got it marked on the board here, so you can go back and refer that to that again if you need to. Um, and Samuel already has a question: Is it possible to make collodion thicker? without extra raw collodion because I found my line problem, if you remember, comes from too thin a collodion. Um, 
Well, thank you, Kurt. I appreciate that, that comment about my book. Thank you. Samuel, um, here's, here's what you can do. If your collodion is too thick, he, he's talking about how viscous or the lack thereof. Um, I think he's talking about um, the, the only two problems you're going to get with collodion is he's, either it's too dry and it's going to create ridges or you have too much water in it and it's going to create chambered lines or crepey lines. Um, you'll probably find that it, I don't know how you got it too thin, but if you did, let it let it uh, evaporate some of the ether or alcohol out, out of it. You don't need to add raw collodion to it. Just let it evaporate a little bit. Pour pour it. Let 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 the uh, pour, pour it bottle to bottle and go back and forth. If you have a drain bottle, it'll get thick pretty quickly. Oscar, hello. You're very welcome from Spain. Awesome. And and J Jan, John or Jan from Norway. Wonderful. Love Scandinavia. Just love it. Absolutely. Uh, dig all those shows on the, um, I think it's the History Channel here in America, the Vikings and the, all those great uh, Scandinavian kind of um, oriented shows. Love it. So let's do this. Let's talk about, get right on topic here, and let's talk about making negatives. Uh, good evening from Poland. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Good to see you guys. Good to see everybody. I, I love all my brother, my European brothers and sisters. I love my time in Europe. It was some of the best. We had a really good time living over there. It was some of the best experiences I've had in, in my life, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> Sasha, uh, greetings from cold and rainy Norway, or Germany, sorry. Yes, uh, Deutschland. I remember Deutschland in uh, February, January, February. Very wet, rainy, and cold, but still beautiful in its own way, right? Um, here in Colorado, in the western part of the United States, or beginning of the west, um, we actually have over 300 days of sun here in Colorado every year. It's uh, Don't tell anybody, because we already have too many people here, but it's a beautiful state. It's a beautiful place to live. But you know what? Drawbacks and all, weather, uh, temperature, bugs, whatever it is, we, we find our place to live and, and we try to make the most of it. So it was premix over time. It got thinner and thinner. And so my edges start to fall off when I put it in the silver bath and have vertical lines from at least it seems to be. No, I don't. I don't think it's that, Samuel. That sounds like a different problem. Um, hey, Fairy Hill from Sweden. Welcome. Welcome. That's good to see you guys. Um, I don't think it's. Uh, uh, over time, it wouldn't have gotten thinner. That 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 goes against the logic and physics of it, because as you have the, especially the ether evaporate, nitrocellulose gums up. You know what it's like. It gets thick and gooey. So it's it's not a problem with that. If you're having peeling edges lifting, um, thinner and thinner. So edges started to fall off when I put it in the silver bath. That's because you're letting it dry out. You're waiting too long to put it in. So if you see a plate that dries out after you pour it with collodion, um, what you'll see, I think I mentioned this last time, is you'll you'll get the center that's wet, and this will be all crackly and dry, like, like dry skin, and it'll break and flake off. That's a drying out problem. You're waiting too long to immerse it into your silver bath, probably. Look at look at that, look at that angle, Samuel, and see if that, that might help you. So greetings, Jakob. From from Poland, welcome. It's good to see everybody. Wow, we got a, we got a big crowd in here today. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming in again. This is going to be a great. Uh, I think you'll get a, a lot out of it. A couple of things I'm going to talk about, and I talk about the densitometer in here. I have a densitometer here that I'm going to use, and I'm going to try to show you. How do I do this? I'm going to try to show you how to use the densitometer. And I'm going to re make the readings for you. I'll put them on the board. I also have my viewing board, my 5600 uh, Kelvin daylight board that I put my negatives on. And then I have an assortment of negatives in front of me. Um, un not redeveloped. Um, some, some from my book uh, redeveloped. Um, some outdoor sky stuff we can look at. And you probably recognize this one. That's the cover of my book or one of them, right? Uh, that looks a lot like that doesn't it or that one of those two so having said that let's talk about first what a negative is um 
Okay, yeah, Samuel, say, I'm just looking at the chat board here. Samuel says, I'll try that again. Even did it slow and fast to see the results. Uh, so what? how long are you waiting? You pour the collodion, and I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you live in Deutsch, uh, Germany, um, humid. So you pour the collodion on. It's going to take, you know, it's going to take a little while, and you can see that skin over. Check that collodion with your thumb or your finger to see if it leaves an imprint. You want to make sure that that's skinned over, but you don't want to wait too long where it starts uh, closing in and uh, drying out. But try that. So just a little bit off topic, not bad though. So let's talk about what is a negative. Page 131 in my book, and I'll just, I, I'm not going to read it, read it. I'm just going to kind of skim it. If you have the book, you can read it in detail. There's, there's a couple of pages here about it. Why I say what is a negative is because a lot of people in this process have a difficult time, um, or maybe not they don't have a difficult time, it's just a vernacular or a description problem, using words that mean something different than what we really think they mean. In other words, um, people will make a bright ambro type and print it on a modern developing out paper, like a Kodak or an Ilford paper or something, and they say this is a wet collodion negative. Um, I guess technically it is, but when we talk about wet collodion negatives, we're not talking about printing out on a bromide or a modern develop out paper um, or, you know, where you use chemicals. We're usually talking about 90% plus of the time, we're talking about negatives that are made to ma make images on printing out paper, contact prints on printing out paper or pop paper. Um, so as it... Uh, <laughs> as, it, as it looks, as as you look at these negatives, and we're going to look at some of them right here in a minute, as you look at the negatives, it's really difficult to distinguish or determine with your eye if you're not used to it, what is a dense enough negative to print on printing out paper. So I'm not going to talk about making images on developing out paper that like Kodak or Ilford. A bright ambrotype, a little bit of overexposed ambrotype prints great on those. And we'll talk about the density in those. And I'll show you one or two of them as well, too. Um, but here, here's the here's the thing uh, what, which I wanted to read. When someone says that they're making wet collodion negatives, to my mind, it means they're printing on albumin or salt paper, or some kind of pop paper, like I just said. However, the vast majority of people who say this aren't making wet collodion negatives. They're making bright ambrotypes, just like I just said. So what I mean by a bright ambrotype is an overexposed by three quarters, uh, a whole stop, sometimes a little more than a stop, overexposed, a bright ambrotype. And I could give I can give you an example of that, which is actually a little, I should have brought something black over here, I guess. Um, I wonder if you'll be able to see this <laughs> this way. That's a very bright ambrotype, okay? See if I can get the reflections out of it. That's a very bright ambrotype. And with, um, trans so that's reflected light, right? And with transmitted light, it looks like this. I, d I guess I should have ran some tests before I did this then. Whoop, that's okay. <clears throat> so that's what it looks like. And you say, wow, that looks very, very dense. And you know, you could say that it's it's dense enough, um, and that's actually that's two stops over, so that's even beyond an acceptable ambrotype. Now we're moving into the negative space. This is an, a non-redeveloped, what I call a non-redeveloped negative, and I'm going to talk about what what it is you're looking for. So so when we talk about this, what are we? How do we determine what an overdeveloped or an overexposed or a bright ambrotype is versus a negative. How do, how do you distinguish that? In the book, I talk about Archer's reference to that. He starts with a properly exposed ambrotype and gives one and a half to two times more light. So if he had a good ambrotype, a, a thin, you know, a thin image on something black using reflected light, it looks good um, and it was five seconds, let's say. He would start with making a negative and the scenes all vary. And I'm going to talk about chemistry here and how that plays in. But all the scenes vary. But he starts, he says he starts with one and a half to two times more exposure. So it would be <clears throat> seven and a half seconds to 10 seconds to start with a negative. Now, 
if that seven or eight second exposure got you here, you still might want to uh, redevelop. Depending now, how do you determine what, what is redevelopment? It's, it's building density on silver that's on the plate to make a more dense image. And specifically to talk, talking about specific pot printing out, printing out processes, um, you'll want the denser the negative, you'll want to match that with the type of pot print you want to make. In other words, if I know that I love salt printing or albumin printing, my negatives are going to be quite dense. If I know I like printing with collodio chloride or gelatin chloride or one of these other printing out processes, um, I can get away with a thinner negative, right? So uh, carbon and oil, they, they, they don't require as dense negative. And let's just get this out there. Let me have a little drink of water. Let's just get this out there. Everybody thinks density. They're thinking this kind of like, boo, just like hardcore. No, when we talk about density, in fact, Kodak's got a great book out there on, on uh, density, uh, uh, density and, and, uh, and values, if you will. And they even say at the, the, the thickest point of the silver, you're still going to get uh, light transmitted through that. So it may be a little different for what collodion. We, we do go a little hardcore, more hardcore. I'm going to show you this one here. And if I can do this, I didn't know I'd have to do it vertically, but I'm going to, I'll have to show them to you like this. Let me take my little pins off of here. I guess I should have tried this before I, before I committed to it, but I think I can actually unplug this too. I can, oh, no, I can't. So let me turn it back on, sorry. Where's my on switch? There it is. So let's see if I can hold this uh, unredeveloped negative versus the redeveloped negative. So there's a landscape scene and a, uh, and a, let me see if I can get it closer. A landscape below and the non-redeveloped negative above. See the sky in this landscape here? I'm going to take a densitometer reading on that sky right now. So just so you, you see um, this sky right here. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to look at it. I'm going to go to the densest part, which is right here. The most, this is up in the Rocky Mountains somewhere. And I'm going to put it under my densitometer. We're going to jump right into this. And I'm going to get a reading on this. And the reading says 1.79. Now, I bet you I can move it around and get over two. If I move it around a little bit. Let's see here. Oh, it's still in the one sevens, one, one eights. Uh, okay, get one five nine. Let me go over to the other side of the sky here. 2.20. So, so let's talk about densitometry just for a second. So when you have completely clear glass or or nothing, let's say the void areas, these corks are pretty good uh, void areas. I can put my finger behind there and you can see my skin. You're still going to have a densitometer reading, and I'll do a cork right here real quick. Um, 0.3. I'll just move it around just a couple of times. 0.3, uh, 0.4. So, so even in the clear areas, you're going to have what they call base fog, or you're going, you're not going to have absolute clear glass necessarily. You're still going to have some registering, something, some silver registering on there. You don't want a whole lot though, right? So if you think of 0.2 to 2.0 and scaling up. So the middle of that would be around 1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2, 1. 1.3 is the mid-range. And you can calculate the stops. I don't do that. I don't need to do that. Why I use a densitometer is I go in and I find my, <clears throat> my brightest areas, my thickest areas, if you will, of silver. Can I get this in here? Any? Okay, maybe I move it back. I, I, I'm screwing it up because of the... 
because of the reading. I, if I covered that up, maybe. No. Um, anyway, I go in for this negative. I'll put it up on a piece of paper. That doesn't work too good, does it? Let me just get a piece of paper. Although, maybe I'll, I'll use that as a reference here. But just so you can see what's going on. I don't want you to be mystified by this as much as you're going to be already. Um, let me grab a piece of paper, if I can. Here's some Hannah Mule paper. This is good stuff. That's, I, like, I like to print on that Hannah Mule. But this is actually co crowbar, but regardless. <clears throat> so although the color isn't that great, and we're not looking, we're kind of looking at, at transmitted light here, not necessarily. But what I'm saying is I would go in this area, and what I like to be, uh, and, and these are all uh, pot prints. So I printed all of these on collodio chloride or a gelatin chloride prints. So if I go in there and I take a reading on that gall, that's what that is, is a gall nut. I'm going to, I already know what it is, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a reading of, let me find the dent, that's pretty dense right there. Uh, one point, whoop, one point six, one point six, and just forgive the the digital transmission, but this right here is one point six. So now I could go down into these other softer areas, a uh, mid mid tone areas, and get a reading. When I see, and I have my own little version of this. But when I see an image that produces good collodio chloride prints, I'll, I'll show you this one again. That one versus this one. <clears throat> you kind of see the difference there? Uh, this is why I like to redevelop, and we'll talk about that in a second. But when I see readings between 1.5 and 1.8, in my highlights, in the thickest part of the image, where the most light struck the plate. And I have my void areas, or my clear areas, between 0.3 and 0.5. I usually have a very good negative to print with, with in, in collodion chloride, gelatin chloride. Now, <clears throat> if I want to step it up, and I want to print uh, albumin or salt or something that requires a lot more density, and when I say a lot more, we're talking from 1.5, 1.6 in the max to 1.8, 1.920, somewhere like that, somewhere like that. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I'll check this and see. Wow, I got stuff all over this one. <clears throat> you'll probably, if you have my book, you'll recognize that negative, the bullet beer can. Let's check. Let's check that. Uh, beer bottle right there in the most dense area. See where that light, this is natural light. Let's see where that light's hitting that and let's check that. I've checked it before and I know it's over too. I'm just going to check it again. Um, let me get it right in the center here. Uh, it's giving me a false reading there. Turn it over. Let's see if I can go through this way. This might be a little bit better. There we go. Right on the neck of it. 2.10. That's over 2 on the densitometer. On the neck of that bottle right there, I took it from the top there. That tells me, and then and then I have void areas here. You can go all the way down. That's my finger. You can see right through the bottom of that can there. That's my finger right in the can. So the void areas, that's 2.1, and the void areas is 0.2. So what it, what it tells you is this. If you have a wide enough range and your D max is good enough for the type of printout you print you want to make and your D min falls in there, you don't want your D min reading, you know, 0.8 or 0.9 or 1.0, right? What does that tell you? That tells you that you have um, silver in there. You're gonna, you're probably overexposed or overdeveloped. You 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 develop silver in that void area. When we say clear glass, we're technically talking clear glass. But there's in film, there's a thing called base fog. It's You're just going to have that. There's going to be a little bit there. It's not going to be clear, clear glass. So when we talk about what is a negative, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, depending on the type of print you want to make, <clears throat> we're talking about the density. 
being in your shadows being 2.0 to 0.3, and then in your highlights being 1.5 to, you know, like 1.6, 1.7 maybe. I'll even say 1.7 might be good. 1.7. That's for collodio, chloride, gelatin chloride, those kinds of things. Now carbon, oil, oil prints really well on that. Um, um, all those print really well on those, uh, those lower, lower D max values on a densitometer with a wet collodion negative. Now, when you go out and you make an, an, an image and you expose it and make a bright ambrotype outside, um, or in the studio, whatever. It's very difficult in the studio to make photo, uh, wet collodion negatives. It, it, I almost said photographs. Um, it's very difficult to do that in a studio. Why is that? Because strobes and CFL and, and any of those artificial light systems really don't provide what's uh, the spectrum that this needs to really punch it out in the highlights. Now, have I made negatives in the studio? Yes, but they're always redeveloped. And I usually have to add so much density to them that you, you end up with this very contrast, a very high contrast image. Um, let, me, let me pull this back one more time just so... Man, I, I didn't prepare very well. My cord's all wrapped up here. And I didn't know the light. Look at how yellow that gets, too, because of the, the daylight. Um, I wanted to show you this negative up here um, so and it's not blue it just looks blue because of the color value on the screen but when you see this uh, if I fill the screen up maybe I can do it there we go if you see this you can see that bottleneck that's my my D max and and I the value that I took from the can down here is my D min Dens density maximum density minimum and again, that range, you, you need to come up with your own system. Some people can do it visually, right? I'll get pretty close, but if I know, especially if I know I want to make an albumin print or a salt print, um, I really have to hit it. I want, do I have to redevelop that? Do I have to get, get on it? Um, and again, we're not talking a density that's, that's out of control. When we talk about bulletproof and real dense, we're talking values in the 1.8, 1.9, and 2.0. Um, can you still see through them? Yes, you can still see through them with transmitted light. I can still see through that bottleneck, but it's not, uh, it's not like a void area, uh, or, or, you know, it, it's, it's, think about the negative laying on the paper and that paper is sensitized. So you have light striking it, going through the neg glass negative onto the paper. So all the light areas are going to be black and all the dark areas are going to be white. It's going to prevent the silver chloride paper from turning dark, or it's gonna let all the light in and turn the silver chloride paper black. You can see that right there, right? I mean, it's a pretty good, pretty good example, if you will. But look at the detail on the navel of the gall versus not. So anyway, that's my little um, pitch on what is a negative versus what isn't a negative. Now, what isn't a negative is a, a is an ambrotype, something that looks great when you back it with something black. Um, let me let me grab an example of that real quick. I, I, I my desk is so full of of negatives. Let me grab an ambrotype, a glass ambrotype, and I'll show you an example of that. I think I can clean that one off pretty good. Do I have another one here? Um, no, that's good. Okay, this one, this one will work fine. This is a little bit um, shroomy, but I'll, get, I'll just bring the box over. Bring my box over here. I should have had my box here, but I really I've ran out of room here, so I got to set that on top of my book. So let's talk about now. What does a glass ambrotype look like? Um, here's here's one that I I usually uh, that might be a little too too much, but let's see if I can compare these. This is beat up, of course, too. So keep that in mind. 
you'll see the difference in these are extreme. Um, so an ambro type on the bottom and a negative on the top. Forgive the color balance. And if I show you against black and using transmitted light, you can see what that looks like. I see myself in there too. So you see all the detail in his shirt and everything versus if I put this up against black. Oh, boo! So a good ambro type meaning a plate that's very underexposed against something black looks great, and a negative against something black transmitted look, light looks like crap. And, and some of them look a lot worse than that. And if they're on black, period, that's that's what probably what a good ambro type will look like, something like that, if I can get the reflections off. That's on black glass. I use that to back these things. So having said that, you, you, can, you can now look at your glass ambro types, look at them, look at them from a standpoint of exposure and say, is this a good ambro type or could I push it to making a negative with it? And I'm trying to just look in my box here and find something else to show you, but I don't know if I can find it. Here's a, oh, here's an, here's an asphaltum back. You know how we asphalt in Fierenheim, Germany, 2007. You can kind of see that a little bit. Um, here's a couple of uh, black glass four by fives. So very underexposed, um, very, uh, uh, these would not, if these were on clear glass, they would not be candidates for negatives. Let's put it that way. So making negatives is very deliberate, is my point. You have to know that you want to make a negative, and if you ex extrapolate that out, you'll want to know what kind of print you'll want to make with that negative as well, too. So in the best of both worlds, you would you would have um there's another one that's got stuff on it, but another, that priest. Um, in the best of both worlds, you would go out with the intention of saying, I'm making negatives today, and I'm making negatives for X type of pop, pop print, or albumin, or salt, or chlorine chloride, or gelatin chloride, those kinds of things. So you just wouldn't want to, uh, you just can't go out and say, Oh, uh, that oh, that's a great image, and it's a positive, and you say oh, I'm going to print that. Well, you, if it's bright enough, you'd probably get away with printing it on modern develop out paper, like I said. But you'll never be able to make a good pot print with it, or a good silver chloride print with it. Um, the thinnest you can really get away with. I've actually, and let's take this priest here, the one that I just showed you. Let's let's do this again. Let me show, refresh your memory here. And the only way I can get get away with this is because of his face. There's a there's the positive of it, right? And if I check his face right here for density, I think I remember what it was, but I'll check it to, and tell you for sure what it is. Um, I'm getting a one. 0.4 on his face. 1.4, 1.5. It just depends on where I'm at. Oh, and there's a 5.5. 5. So on the thin part, okay, that's on the thin part. Let me hold this up. On the thin part, I'm getting 0.4, and on the heavy side, I'm getting 1.4. So I, I, I think I've actually printed this on collodio chloride. And so that'd probably print good on oil too. And it'd definitely print good on modern develop out paper. So there is some latitude there. But if you get into these other printing out processes, you're, these things will fail terribly. They'll just be a big, muddy mess. You just won't have that definition. Um, so it kind of shows you, again, when we talk density, we're not talking about Pour redeveloper on it until it's just a big black thing. We're talking about being specific about what you want to do, your end result with it, or you can kind of shoot in the middle 
and try to go for some um, middle of the road kind of values. Um, sometimes that works. I've, I've tried that on a couple of, couple of different ideas that I've had. Sometimes it worked really well and a lot of times it doesn't work at all. You have to kind of commit to what you want to do for the absolute best results. Um, just like every, everything and everybody, I encourage people to play with this and, and see, see what you get. Every, uh, your mileage will vary, I guarantee it. So, how is a negative made? We talked about that just a little bit about exposure. And I use, I use Arch's formula that says if I've got a good, if I've got a good um, positive at five seconds, I'm going to go for a negative at seven to 10 seconds. That's kind of my baseline. I start with that. And depending on light, depending on other conditions, um, you'll, you'll find your sweet spot. What happens a lot is people will uh, get in an environment and make a positive and judge that positive as, and they like it bright. So already they're overexposed. So they're not, make, and, and you hear me harp on this. You hear me talk about everybody's positives are overexposed. You know, the regular positives they post online. A lot of them are. People tend to want the images brighter than they really should be. So when I'm talking about a properly exposed positive, I'm talking about, well, I think I pointed this out last time. There's one behind me, that this, this guy over here, right? All that tonal range, all that value. Um, that's the kind of positive I'm talking about. Um, one that gives you that range, not all blown out. Because then what you're doing is you're starting with a, a positive that's uh, three seconds, that should be really two seconds. So now you're going to six seconds when it should be four seconds for a negative. And what happens when you over, you can get away with overexposing a positive. What happens when you overexpose a negative? You lose density. That's what happens. So the very thing you're trying to go for and balance in that little tiny window of exposure, you actually go over that and you lose density. So let me, let, I'm going to try to illustrate that for you here. I'm going to wipe two away and one away because we've already talked about that. And up here, I'm going to do this little illustration. X is our, our issue. X. We don't know what our exposure is when we go out. Can I turn that a little bit? We don't know what our exposure is when we go out. So X right here is our exposure. And we don't know what that is, right? We go out. We don't know what a, and I'm talking negatives. We don't know what that is when we go out. So we go out and we make a positive. And the positive, a good positive, not an overexposed positive, equals two seconds. Okay? Um, and so we use Arch's formula, and what we do is we, we double that. So we add another two seconds for a total of four seconds. Now, what this normally does what, it will get us in the ballpark. We still don't know what the actual value is of the exposure. We just don't know that, right? We can't test it with a meter because it's UV light, most, most sensitive. Oh, and read that, uh, read that PDF that I put in the chat. He talks about those values of what AGI, AGBR, um, sodium, uh, silver chloride, those values, what nanometer light spectrum those values work best at, and the percentages of those. That's a great paper. By the way, Jacobson and Jacobson uh, did the uh, varnish on that piece. So, um, so four seconds will get you in the range on that. But we still, it's still a mystery. That couldn't, that, that could be off. It could be either way. Usually, I won't start with two times. I'll start with one and a half times. So rather than going four seconds, I'll go with three seconds. If this value is two seconds on a, on a good positive. So that three seconds will do what? That, that will get me within the range. Let's say we now know the value. We don't really know it when we're doing it, but we now know the value is five seconds for a perfect negative. Well, this three seconds and two seconds is underexposed. That three seconds puts me right in the middle, so to speak, of that value for making a properly exposed negative. So if you happen to, you happen to hit that five seconds and right on the nose, and everything was perfect, great, good for you. That's called a foundation negative. Foundation negative. 
Um, how often does that happen? Not very often. I've done it once in a while, once in a great while. I do my calculations, I hit it, boom, no problem. It's right there. It'll print on the type of paper I want. It looks great. There's nothing else that needs to be done. Most of the time, I will be a little bit under, a half a stop, uh, you know, a third of a stop, somewhere in there. What advantage does that give me? That gives me the advantage of going back in the dark room and taking that three second exposure and chemically adding those two seconds. Why do I want to chemically add those two seconds? Because the minute I would go over that with in the camera exposing that plate, the minute I start losing density and the minute I start uh, fogging my void, filling my void areas up, my, my clear glass up, it, it, it's a mess. You lose density in the highlights and you fog all the void or shadow areas. So redevelopment gives me that ability to go from three seconds to five seconds. And I do that with pyrogalic acid and uh, little little drops of uh, Agno-3. And you can read in the book, um, redevelopment is uh, page 135, 136. You can read those recipes in there if you have the book. That's what I do. That's my methodology. You can read, read this methodology in the book in more detail. It'll probably make a little more sense. But I'm so paranoid of going over and losing high density in the highlights, plugging my shadow areas up, and not making a decent negative. And if you're out in the field doing this, the last thing you want to deal with are those kinds of mistakes. Um, a lot of times we only get one chance. You know, the light's right. Every You know, it takes three, four, five minutes to get everything sensitized and set up. Now you're on a clock for drying the plate out. We're, we're working with wet collodion in such a small window that all these variables, as many as you can take care of in the beginning or during the process, the, the, the greater chance of success you'll have. Um, that's why this process is so frustrating for so many people. They're like, wow, this is just over the top. I can't get my head around all this chemistry and physics and, and everything else. Um, I try to explain it in the best lay terms possible because I'm a layman myself and I've tried to study it and learn it um, both from the organic chemistry side and the physics side and then synthesize it into the, the most lay terminology that I know how to communicate it. And this is one of the basic exposure formulas that I use for making wet collodion negatives and preventing that overexposure with the original exposure, losing density. And then people say, oh, you don't always have to redevelop. That's true, you don't. If you're a, a whiz or you get lucky or you just really dial that in, uh, we're gonna talk about chemistry here in a second. You can avoid redevelopment, you can. I tend to like to do, even if I have a, a damn near perfect negative, right out of foundation or negative, right out of the camera, I'll do, a 20 mil splash or redev on it. It just crisps it up. It just it just defines everything. They just print so much better to my mind. They just do. Um, not all, you don't have to. You, you'd make a fine print without it, and it could be just psychological for me, but this is the formula that I use. Um, redevelopment is 90, 95% plus of the time for me because I'm creeping up to that proper exposure Basically, what I have in the field is this. I have a, a way over. There's that can never be. What does that look like? Is a let me put it on a black glass now that I have something solid. Look at that <clears throat> on the black glass. Um, there's just no way that that could ever be a good positive, right? But that you could experiment, and that prints great on most most paper most paper, but I could still splash redeveloper on there, just, just one cup, 20 mil cup or something, and tighten all that up and bring it in to these good value ranges like that one, right? That was done with north window light and then redevelop. This one um, is out in the Rockies here. You'll see that doesn't, that's got developer suite. Uh, actually, I tried to print that. I redeveloped that though. It looks so much better as a negative anyway. So depending on your methodology and how you like to make negatives, or if you haven't made negatives, um, most of you probably haven't made negatives. Maybe you've made some accidentally or 
or maybe you've never done pot printing, once you get into making negatives in wet collodion and printing, I mean, positives are great, but this is so uh, much more liberating to make prints with negatives than just making one-off positives. One-off positives are great. Don't get me wrong. Please don't email me and say that I'm a jerk for saying that. I love positives. Believe me, I do. But once you get into making proper negatives, the world's your oyster. You can, you know, the, be, be, between the types of pot prints you want to make, the toning, um, you have so many options. I just, I just love that idea. I love the idea of one-off, pop, boom, you're, you're done. Uh, Ambro type, that's what you have. Tin type, that's what you have. That's wonderful. But once you get into making negatives and you have that ability to make these different colored prints, uh, these different types of papers, these different types of processes, even the variants rather, um, the ideal world in the ideal world, you'd want to have a negative that would print on everything below salt and albumin. And that's a lot of printing space you can you can eat up with that. Carbon, oil, gelatin, collodio, gelatin uh, collodion, uh, or gelatin chloride. So many options you have, so many toning options you have. It just opens a whole new world up. So I encourage people to get into this and look at making negatives, uh, figure out a way that works for you. Um, I've laid out in the book the best way I know how to come up with the best negative possible for any certain type of printing out process you want to, printing out uh, paper you want to try. Um, and those values that I just gave you here will get you in the range. Your mileage will vary a little bit, but they'll get you in the range. And uh, you'll, you can make some beautiful, beautiful prints. I've kind of, I used to love printing years ago. I used to love printing albumin and salt, and I, and I still do to a certain degree. But man, I've fallen completely in love with collodial chloride and gelatin chloride. I love oil printing as well. Um, for those of you that have the book, you can go in and watch uh, chapter 12 is all pot printing. You can go in and watch me make, uh, I don't have that negative, it's over on the rack. Uh, you can go in and watch me make an oil print of the, the keep out tree. Um, I just I just love it. I just love making oil prints. Carbon is wonderful too. Um, but the idea is, is this gives you a lot of uh, latitude for making photographs, not just a one-off ambro type, one-off tin type. Nothing wrong with that. But this opens up a whole new approach or avenue. I think we mentioned this a billion times. But in the 19th century, you were only called a photographer if you made negatives and prints. You were called an ambrotypist or a tintypist or, you know, whatever, whatever other positive um, process or var variant is really what it is. Whatever positive variant you worked in, you were that ist or a daguerreotypist, or a calotypist, you know, that kind of thing. So that's the exposure. Let's, let's move on to chemistry. What is the, what's the difference between positive chemistry and negative chemistry? This, this is where it uh, catches people a little bit off guard. Um, chemistry, you can look on page 132 of my book, and you'll, you'll see all the formulas and the reasons and all that. I'm going to briefly describe them here. I think I did this before, but we're going to do it again. Positive, making positive, tin types, ambro types, negatives, making negatives for um, pot prints, printing out paper. Um, this will apply to any variant that you want to do, whether it's albumin and salt or some of the, the other gelatin or um, collodion based um, type prints. Positive, and this is all based off of 1,000 milliliters or one liter of water. Um, you have between 38 and 40 grams of iron in positives. So that's 3.8 to 4%. Negatives, you have 18 to 20 grams of iron. So that's 1.8 to 2% iron. So right off the bat, you see we cut the iron in half. Why do we cut the iron in half in the developer? This is a chem, sorry, this is the developer. Um, I'll, I'll go to collodion next, but I wanted to talk about developer first. Why do we cut the developer in half? Uh, we cut the iron in half. Because like last week I talked about in development, the action of that iron, that, that, that 
double replacement process. Um, you can see that in the book or watch the last video. Um, that double replacement action happens a lot faster and a lot more aggressive the more iron or reducer you have in the developer. So we cut that down. So we have time to let all the details come in. The details that we're not going to see with our eyes with the reflected positive stuff, but transmitted going on to paper. So this is developer. Sorry, I should have said that. Uh, okay, so there's the iron based on a one liter, one liter um, solution. So that's uh, 3.8 to 4%, 1.8 to 2%, half basically cut in half. Um, the acid or the reducer, we have um, 30 to 40 mils in positive and 80 to 90 mils in negative. So this is 3 to 4% and 8 to 9%. Again, do you see this theme? We, we cut, now we go the opposite way. We add twice in the developer reducer in the developer for the negatives than we have in the positives. <clears throat> Why is that? What does the reducer do? It holds back development. So you have time to bring all those details in, those subtle shadows and midtones and all that range down to the, the, to the pure glass or the void areas. In printing out, <clears throat> you will actually see things on the print that you can't really even see holding the, the negative up to light. That's how, that's how much detail and all the subtle stuff, all that range in there. And that's really what the, uh, the cadmium or the bromide is, is, is uh, responsible for. And we'll talk about that in a second, in the collodion. So that's 8% to 9%, depending on where you're at. That's 3% to 4%. Iron and acid. Uh, alcohol has no, uh, you know, you want to use as little like I talked about last time as you can. If you have a new bath, you don't have to use any. And then the water, the DH2O, or the distilled or, or deionized water is 1,000 mils. So that's the, that's the developer. So you've decreased your iron by half and you've in, increased your, your acid by twice as much, right? Or roughly, roughly is what I'm talking about. So if you stay within those parameters, that's why your development, when you do a negative, you're not doing 15 seconds, you're doing 45 seconds to two minutes, depending on the exposure in the scene and the little bit of variation that you might have in your iron and your acid. Those are the two main players. So now let's talk about the collodion. What's the difference in the collodion and why is that? Well, the first thing you're gonna see in the book on page 130 or on page 132, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see that the um, that the iodide and bromide ratios. You're going to see the difference in the iodide and bromide ratios. So let's. I want and there's a point here that I want to make. So if you if you have the book, turn to page 132 and look at the uh, negative collodion there on page 132. Look at the difference. So here's the collodion. I'll write this out for you guys that don't have the book. This is the collodion for negatives. Neg collodion. So this is, I'm going to do positive, negative again. This is for collodion. So here on the salts, you have um, two G's of, in this case, I'm just going to say bromide, and you have five G's of iodide. And it doesn't matter what flavor. I use CDBR and NH4I. It doesn't matter. And positives. If you look at positives, what do we have? We have, go, go, now go to, I'll give you the page number here. If you go to page, um, this is in um, chemist, making chemistry. It's on page uh, 50, one and a half and two. Let's see. Let's make sure I have that right. Iodide. Bromide's one and a half. One and a half bromide and two um, iodide. So let's look at this here. One and a half bromide, two bromide, two iodide, and five iodide. Why the big jump in iodide? Anybody have an idea? Well, we're making negatives, right? 
positives, we're making negatives, and we want, this is primarily responsible for contrast. This is primarily responsible for, like, say, mid-tone. And when I say this, if you look in that PDF that I uploaded, download that and take a look at what these nanometer, what the spectrum is, and what these are sensitive to, you'll be amazed at how far up this goes on the on the spectrum and, and where this is. This is mostly UV. So we're going over twice the amount of iodide for negatives, just, just in the salts, okay? So that tells us that we're putting a more iron, or less iron, more acid, more iodide, and less bromide in this entire chemical mix. People say, well, do I have to make different chemistry for negatives? No, you don't. You can use your positive, but you're going to get closer to your mark, or do I have to nourish myself before the race? Probably you don't, but you might do better. That's the idea behind that. That's the same thing here. So looking, that's the negative collodion. Um, I uploaded this morning, talks about a 2% collodion rather than a 4%, but no difference there. The, mainly the salts, the negative, the salts, over, over twice as much iodide and a little, a little more bromide, another 20% or so there. So that's the chemistry in collodion and negatives in making, or collodion make, neg, for making negatives and developer for making negatives. So the idea, again, is to come up on, and, and Archer's overexposure is on page 132 as well. The idea is to come up on that proper exposure without, um, without going over and then coming back in and redeveloping. And let's talk about redeveloping here real quick. Redeveloping. I know people have different uh, thoughts on this, but I'm going to share mine. <clears throat> Mr. O'Donnell, Peter says, playing around with potassium iodide instead of ammonium iodide in an effort to open the shadow areas on positives. Good results for positives. What's your thoughts on for negatives and density? That's a good point. Um, so let, let's address that real quick first. Let, let's, he's, he's talking about, um, as you all know, when we talk about iodides or bromides, we're talking about that's the main component. It's an iodide. Is it a K? Is it a B, R? Is it, a, is it a, uh, an NH4? What, what, it, what, what do these matter? Um, he's talking about using a potassium, so it's Ki, Ki in positives. What what happens there? Ki versus NH4I up here is what I use. Um, what happens there is the Ki is not soluble in. Whoop! There goes my book. Is not soluble. The Ki is not soluble in solvents. So what happens is you have this precipitate it come, come out of the solution. It'll cake up on the bottom of your bottle. It'll be white. You can just let it sit and then decant the collodion off the top or whatever. Um, it's fine. No problem. The benefit with that is you'll get a little more speed for a longer time, meaning your shelf life will be longer. It won't break down as fast. The iodides won't release an iodine turning red. The drawback with that is you won't get the range you want for negatives. Neg I have never, um, well, ammonium, iod uh, 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 ammonium iodide is the primary driver for negatives, the NH4I. Why is that? Because it's soluble, it breaks down quick, it turns your collodion faster, but the shelf life is shorter. You really, you know, Negatives, the best negatives that I've made is, is, are with kind of an orange color, uh, orangish, a darker orange color collodion, meaning that the iodides have broken down quite a bit and produce um, better density, better contrast. Um, not saying you can't do that with KI. You absolutely can. Um, and again, I want to make that clear. I am not speaking in absolutes here. I am talking about what I've experienced, what I've read from the primary literature, and the results that I've had. So, yes, you can use Ki, potassium iodide, as the iodide in negative for collodion for making negatives. Absolutely. Um, 
the developer, you want to be a little more strict with that because you, you know, what we're really talking about is the micron size of the silver grains, right? One to three to four. Uh, and you're talking about reflected light versus transmitted light, negatives versus positives. And you're going to get a lot of more information coming through that glass than reflecting off of black. Your eyes are going to only see so much. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we get as much information in that on that plate with the negative as we can. That's why we want to slow down that reduction, both with the, 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 the fewer grams of iron and adding more um, acid or more reducer or uh, a restrainer. Those are really important. As far as the types of salts you use, <clears throat> experiment and see. KI is great for positives, especially for people that only make a few plates a month or want a longer shelf life. Um, years ago, I stole it from the Kodak manual. I said, just make an iodizer. You know, nobody was making iodizer then. Everybody just mixed your collodion up and you sit on your shelf, you used it or you didn't, it turned red over time and it'd go bad. Uh, I don't know, it was my third book or something. I said, hey, look, use this Kodak iodizer pro uh, methodology. You make your make your salts and solvents in one bottle and your collodion over here. And you mix a proportion up 1.33 and you've got working collodion. You, can all, you, you only mix as much as you want. Both of those compounds and components stand alone, sit on your shelf forever. So there are ways around um, you know, if you don't like the sediment in your bottle, if you're if you don't like the clearing time it takes, and you can use it without having it clear as well too, the KI collodion. Um, but if you like the speed, if you like the shelf life, use that um, and play around with the negative side of it and see. Um, yeah, ammonium iodide is kind of the driver for all of this. It, it's the it's the big driver. So all kinds of iodides. Uh, make your choice. Uh, play around. We talked about density. We talked about chemistry. We talked about exposure. We talked about development. Let's talk about redevelopment. That's the last thing I have here is redevelopment. What is redevelopment? What is that? And what does that consist of? That consists of DH2O. I'm going to get rid of this down here. That consists of DH2O or distilled water or deionized water. I say DH2O. Uh, pyrogalic acid, um, and I'll describe this in a second, um, citric acid, and um, the addition of drops of AgNO3 or AgNO3, silver nitrate. So let's talk about what this does. You have your negative. This is not redeveloped, and this will print fine. I printed it. You have your negative and you, you don't have enough density for X pot print, like I talked about. So you know you want to redevelop this a little bit, or a lot, or a medium, whatever it is you want to do. This is the beautiful thing. I used to publish stuff about um, um, doing intensification, and there's nothing wrong with intensification. Intensification is a different method of gaining density. It's using copper sulfate, ammonium bromide, and silver nitrate. It's quite expensive because it's a one splash of your plate in a in a in a in a tub of, of silver nitrate, and it's one swoosh. It just covers the whole negative, and uh, you build density. You can do mild intensification. You can do strong, whatever you want. I stopped publishing that for the simple fact of control. You don't have the control you have here. What you have here, and I usually mix this in in one liter. Uh, one liter uh, quantities, and I pour it out in these little developer cups, and I call, I call 30 mils a developer. I call that one cup. So I come up with this little system. Is this a one cup, a two cup, a three cup? What what cup de uh, redeveloper is this? So for the thinner stuff or or for the negatives I want more density on, I do two or three cups. And what do I mean by that? I mean. If I did um, 90 mils of this mixture with um, 20 drops, roughly, you know, 8 to 10 drops per cup, or 7, it depends, 7 to 10 drops of, of silver nitrate drop into the cup, and then these components added gives me one cup. And if I do that three times, that's 90 mils. So that would be quite a dense negative. 
I pour it on, pour it off, pour it on, pour it off. But let's talk about what this is. It's got distilled water, of course, pyrogalic acid. This word throws people off. When they see acid, they think restrainer, and they probably should. That's not the restrainer here. The citric acid is the restrainer here. This is the stainer um, or the developer, e either way you want to put it. Can you use uh, um, iron? Can you use ferrous sulfate? Yeah, it's not quite as powerful, but you can definitely use that. We're talking one gram. I've actually upped this now. My recipes, I used to do one gram. I do up to 4% now on, on pyro and uh, six, six grams of restrainer or 6%. Um, and then, like I said, seven to 10 drops, depending on that. So um, before you do actually do all this, you're pouring your developer, your redev on your plate on and off and on and off. And maybe I'll try to show this. If Speaking of this, let me, let me segue here for just a second. If any of you guys know a way that I can broadcast and go into my dark room and show this kind of stuff live without destroying my equipment and all that stuff, let me know. Because I would love to show you here in my studio in my dark room. I, I, I'd demonstrate these techniques. Somebody asked me about that yesterday on Facebook. And I said I'd, I'd try to do that, but... Um, it's different. It, it's it's difficult, rather. And I can't take my laptop in there and set it up. It's, the camera's not built for red light and all that, although I can do a lot of this stuff under white light. But anyway, um, if you know, drop me a line or drop me an email and let me know. So that's Redeveloper. But before you do the Redeveloper, what you have to do, and I talked about this last week, I think, just a little bit. Here's your plate. Um, Jan asks, what is your opinion about intensifying with pyrogallic acid, citric acid, and silver before fixing? Um, yes, uh, they, they have done that. You can do that. Exactly. I understand what you're saying. Um, it's kind of like uh, the same approach. It depends on, you know, six one way, half a dozen of the others, drawbacks on both, really. Uh, it's kind of like taking the approach of having your pot print, and before you fix it, you tone it right? Um, or you, you fix it and then you tone it. This is the same idea. He's asking, uh, what's your, what do you think about after you've developed it, you've arrested the development, there's your negative, pour your, your uh, redev on there. Um, and what, what he's basically doing is uh, you're now taking, you're redeveloping all the unexposed silver along with the exposed silver on there, right? It doesn't matter because you're going to fix it and you're going to remove all that off. You can try that and see if you like it. Test that out and see if you like it. I prefer this way. Now, what's the drawback this way? I'm gonna, that was a great segue, actually. Before you take the cup and the pyro and the citric and redevelop, here's your image. And let's draw a little face on here. You'll see what kind of artist I am here. Let's see. Little smiley guy here. So here's your plate. What you do is you take a dilute... A very, well, not a very dual, uh, uh, iodine. You take it liquid iodine and you take a bottle of distilled water. I like to use distilled water. I guess you don't have to. But you add um, iodine into, liquid iodine, into that distilled water and make kind of a, a sherry red, kind of a, a red color water. So you have enough iodine in there. Um, it's when you pour this over the plate, this is a fixed plate, right? This just came out of the watt. You developed it, you fixed it, and you washed it. You pour that, that liquid, this iodine, over the plate, and all the highlight areas made of silver take on this iodine. What happens when iodine hits silver? What do you think happens? There's this little process. A-G-I. Silver iodide. It kind of converts back. Iodide hitting silver, metallic silver, changes over into AGI. And we know that this is light sensitive. This is a very, very mild form of this. But what you're doing is think about opening up again. Why do you want to open that silver up? Because all the highlights you want and the midtones, the glass area you don't care about. But all of these you want to open up to take what? Your pyro and your silver when in redevelopment. 
So you open it up with the weak solution of iodine over the plate. You wash it, and you'll see, you'll wash it off. It'll be a little bit greasy again. Then I like to expose it to, to really strong UV light. You'll actually build a little bit, bit of density right off the bat. This is, this is the true scientific methodology to say that this iodine actually makes that silver sensitive to some degree again. But then when you take it in the dark room, and you start doing your one cup, two cup, three cup with your uh, acid and your, your silver, boom, 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 boy, you, you can just bring them up. And the beautiful thing over intensification, intensification is different than redevelopment. Keep in mind, redevelopment, you have the control. You can stop at one cup. You can stop in, in half a cup. You can stop, you know, you can put 10 mils on it, 5 mils on it, or 100 mils on it. Whatever it is you do, you have control. You can actually physically see that density. So I go in there, and remember, I like to add that two seconds chemically. I go in there, and I visually add that two seconds chemically or I build that contrast up chemically that way, that quick. So this is done before redevelopment. This is rehalogenation, is what I call it, or resensitizing the plate. And all you're doing is pouring that iodine, that weak solution of iodine and distilled water over the plate. All the silver on the plate, remember you reduce the reduction process and the development reduces to the metallic state of silver. Um, you pour that iodine on there, it sensitizes it again to a degree and kind of opens it up to receive this pyro, this redeveloper stainer. It's really a stainer. Pyro stains, and it's very dangerous, so handle it with care. I talk about that in the book. Um, so if you look at the entire to be negatives, I want to make negatives of this project. Why do you want to make negatives? Well, I want to do multiple shows. I want to be able to sell prints. I want to have a certain color, a toning. I want it, whatever reason it is, right? You, you decide that. Then you come up and you say, this is the gear I have. What does it require to make negatives? What collodion negatives with this gear? Uh, this is how fast my lens is. This is the size of the, this is the format I want to make them in, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you sit down and you start cutting your glass and you've got your project in mind, what the first thing you want to do is run a test. You want to test everything out. You cut your glass, you clean your glass. And I talked, I, I, Michael asked about this uh, via email. Um, when, when you clean your glass, calcium carbonate, <clears throat> distilled water and alcohol is what I use. And, and just good, clean, Viva, non-patterned paper towels. And then I al either albuminize the edges with a little Q-tip and a little bottle of egg whites or you can submerge the whole thing or pour, uh, uh, steam it up a little bit and pour the albumin, liquid albumin, drain it off and let them dry. Um, either way, you want to do that. Um, but cleaning is really important and you want to use calcium carbonate, alcohol and distilled water to do that. I wear rubber gloves and I do not use patterned towels because that has ink in it and the alcohol will hit that. So make sure you clean your plates really well, albuminize them. Why do you albuminize the plates for negatives uh, and positives if you want, if you're having problems with adherence? You, in negatives, the pyrogalic acid here shrinks collodion a little bit. It'll, it'll pe usually peel that collodion right up. It shrinks it. So you want it stuck to the plate really well. Um, so there's a lot of prep work. So you sit down, you cut your glass, you clean your glass, you albuminize it. You make your chemistry. And I advise, I, I recommend, go ahead and make a batch of negative only your developer, your collodion, um, everything else is pretty much the same, right? Those are the two big players. And make a, make a small batch you can experiment with and go out and start running tests. And then when you get to a point where you understand the density differences, make you a batch of redeveloper and sit down and start playing with redevelopment. And uh, you will be surprised, number one, how satisfying it is. And moreover, the, the options you have for printing, for toning, all those things that I mentioned, it's incredible. You'll just, you'll fall in love all over again with wet collodion. You just, you just will, and you'll never tire. I, I'm going up on the mountain here in a few months, and I feel like, you know, I'll be, I'll go radio silence for a while while we build. But I'm coming back online with a Northlit studio, a beautiful dark room, and a gorgeous place at 8,500 feet sea level. The UV up there just screams. I mean, my my exposures will be tiny. Uh, I mean, that's negative city. I'll do I'll do some uh, 
some Rocky Mountain work up to, while I'm up there and do prints. And I'm really excited to be to have the opportunity to to go up there and do that stuff. Let's see, Tim Fry. What is your technique in pouring the iodine onto the plate? I've actually burned huge hairs. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes, and and in my book I talk about that again. Um, these are subtleties. Uh, Tim just asked, um, what's your what's your methodology of pouring on the iodine? This weak iodine solution. If you go like this and you pour right in one direct area, just like your developer developing a plate, you'll get a burn. This iodine will burn bad. I mean, and you can also stain. If you don't rinse well enough, you'll stain the iodine. They'll turn red, blah, 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 all that stuff. So you want it just like developer. You want one smooth action, drain it, put it on, and then just let it kind of float around. I like it. I like to, to get it soaked in really well, drain it off run it under the water. You'll see it looks greasy. Just put it under the water until it's not greasy anymore. Don't go too much, but don't go too little. People go too little and it stains everything red. Not that that hurts much, but and then go out and expose it. Or if you don't want to expose it, just go ahead and do your redevelopment. redevelopment. Thanks, Quinn. I've always made negative was just the intensification method, which was certainly always fit. Yes, uh, John, that's that's a very good point. Again, nothing wrong with intensification, but it's costly. And moreover, you have no control. You, uh, you, you just drop your plate into, you bleach your plate with, uh, with copper sulfate and ammonium bromide, uh, bleach it through, the old literature says, to white. Then you drop it in a 10, 12% bath of silver nitrate, and it just stains the, all the silver that's on that plate. So if you have if you don't want that much density, you can cut that in half. I guess you have a little control in there, but one cup, two cup, you have control with redevelopment instead of intensification. I just decided to leave that out of my books for the last couple of books I've done because it just people, you know, it's it's just it's expensive and you don't have control. So very good point, John. Jakob, how do you clean a plate when fully albuminized and bad image received? Yeah, full albumin coating holds the clothing layer tight. It's not easy. Yeah, um, very good point. Um, hot water usually will first take, uh, it'll soften the albumin or uh, soften the uh, collodion and it will actually soften the albumin too. I actually, I, I, I edge with albumin most of the time, but if you do the full plate, you're probably going to have to uh, um, scrap that. Um, I, I've recommended in the past people take razor blades uh, and then all of a sudden you have these micro scratches and you see them all over the negative. So it's not a very good methodology. So hopefully you get your stuff right. I like to run test plates before I run my all the time cutting and prepping and cleaning and albuminizing. I kind of know, unless I have an absolute accident, I kind of know that I'm going to get within the specs. But great, great question, Jakob. That's a good question. Respis. Can you just expose your negative to iodine fumes for redevelopment? Um, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. In fact, I have a whole daguerreotype set up over here. If anybody wants fuming boxes, mercury pot, a fume hood and all that. The problem with exposing, um, yes, to answer your question, yes, you could. Because look, it's technically and chemically and physically, it's metallic silver on your plate and you put it over iodide, iodine uh, fumes, um, and they'd have to be crystals or some silica like daguerreotype exposed in that. Yes, you could definitely do that. Um, what, what helps you here is again, you have a little more control. If you find your particular negatives sensitized with a solution that's half the density of this or half the color of that, then you can mix it half. If you need a little more, you can add a little more. Um, just a lot easier to go this route than trying to uh, fume over just the iodine fumes. And, and those wouldn't be just fumes from the bottle of iodine. They probably wouldn't be quite strong enough. You'd actually need crystals or silica that's sensitized with those the strong, strong like daguerreotype stuff, right? That, that, kind of, that would definitely work, but um, uh, way over the top. This is much, much easier to do this way. Um, so... So that, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the beginning of making negatives. Next week, I would like to talk about making prints. Talk about paper, making prints. Um, 
how, uh, you know, this it's going to be a long one because making prints, absolutely, you're very welcome. Thank you for watching my videos. I appreciate that. Again, all of you guys are just wonderful. I, I couldn't and would not do this without that kind of help and support. So thanks for watching my videos. Thanks for the kind words. Thanks for all that stuff. Um, but next week, I'm going to... Um, uh, I want to go over pot printing. So now you have you have your your great negative. You have your negative that's either foundation negative made in the camera. You don't need to redevelop in this certain type of print, and you're going to print it, or you need to redevelop it. Either way, it's varnished. It's set up for a week. You're ready now to put it in a contact printer. I'm going to show you some paper, some gear, and uh, I'll probably go ahead and make a couple of prints beforehand, or if you want. I can sit here and uh, run in the dark room and pull and uh, I can sh maybe show you that way. But either way, we'll communicate what um, the important aspects of making pot prints, or at least how I do it. I have a Ryonat UV bot a screen printer over here, and I also have a north lit um, sun window over here that I can print out in. So you're very welcome. Poznan, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say Siemnika, Siemnika, uh, Poznan. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate My Polish is almost non-existent, but um, I appreciate you guys watching. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Oh, there's one. Uh, Sanford. Can redevelopment occur after a plate has dried? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a great question. Good. Um, if you have albuminized your plate very well, if you have no weak points, I call them fish gills, little pieces of clothing that kind of come up on the side and they start flapping and then your whole plate goes away in the water. If, you, if your plate is solid, especially if you've albuminized the entire plate, um, you could theoretically wet that again, iodine, exposure, redevelop. Um, I don't recommend that because you always run the risk. This is what happens, everybody. This is what happens. When collodion dries, it, it, it uh, dries. Uh, obviously, there's, there's water in it. That's why it's wet, right? Or some solution in it. It changes form a little bit, right? It, just like everything, uh, water freezing or cooling, any of that. Freezing, you expand and crack. But what happens when you wet it again, it, it starts to move. And if you have any weak spots in there, that collodion will crack and lift up and you're done. So I always recommend working with the plates all the way through development, fix, wash, redevelopment, then dry. And I actually recommend drying over a flame or some heat source of oven, heating the whole thing up and drying it all at once, then varnishing it, then putting it on your rack for a week and letting it cure. Then you're able to put it against paper and print. Oh, dark room. Oh, okay. Good. Very good. Pose none. Okay, good. I got you. Uh, Bittishin, uh, Sasha, I'm happy. I'm happy that you guys are in here. So anything else? If not, what time is it? It's 1121. We, we went for a little marathon. I try to hold them around an hour, but if you guys hang out, I'm, I'm happy to, to go that route. Again, this is the only thing I can do is pitch my book. If you, if you don't have my book and you like this stuff, and you want uh, you want good information? Um, come and check it out. Um, take a look at it. I uh, I have my Sand Creek stuff in here. I have my uh, all my technical information. Um, this guy is amazing. You guys that have the book, um, this guy here, Sol Silas Soul. I tell the story about him. I went to his grave here in Denver and uh, made a plate negative of his grave and a pot print. So. Thank you, Jan. Very informative lesson. I, I thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And I tell me if I get too over the top or if it's too technical and you guys are falling asleep, let me know. It is difficult. Hang in there. Stay with us. Come back and revisit the stuff and study up a little bit. These dots will start to connect and you'll have these eureka moments. You know, oh my God, I get it. I understand. Thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend, Pat. Thank you. Your box. Uh, Went out FedEx the other day. I hope you have it. I, I've, I've lost track now when that was, but you should have it soon in the next couple of days. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are wonderful. 
Oh, thank you, John. The book is certainly worth. Thank you very much. And get into those videos too. I have 42 videos that, that go in, not as personable as this maybe, but go into all the technical details. And I think there's 42 of them up there, high def videos. I spent almost a year shooting them. So thank you for your compliments. Thank you for your, uh, your participation. Like again, you could be anywhere on a Saturday morning, afternoon or evening, or maybe you're somewhere in the world that's Sunday now. But um, whenever you watch this, I appreciate your participation. Send me an uh, email, send me a message, Facebook, whatever you have. If you have questions, you wanna address something, even if it's not the topic we're talking about, let me know. Next week, pop prints. I'm gonna kind of focus on collodio chloride because I think that's a printing out process that most people can get with beginning negatives and it's not as complex as some of the other ones, maybe mixing the formula, but I'll talk about that, I'll, the emulsion, I'll talk about that, so. Oh good, you received it, Pat, awesome, that's good to hear. Jeff, oh yeah, I am looking forward to seeing my new studio too. And just for you guys that don't know, in June, uh, my wife and I, Jeannie, plan to be living we have a trailer house on our property. We have 12 acres in central western Colorado here uh, that we're building a large structure on. Half of it's going to be our house and half of it's going to be a studio and a dark room and a blacksmith and bladesmith shop and a garage, basically. And we hope to, uh, we're going to have a big greenhouse. We hope to, in a year or so, maybe maybe a year and a half, we hope to have people start coming up for retreats. Um, we're gonna be all off of the grid. Uh, solar power, we have a well up there, we have an on-site waste system going in. Um, and I'm gonna teach photography with a Northlit studio. Um, I'm gonna teach bladesmithing and blacksmithing. And this will only be a couple times a year uh, for one or two people. We're gonna have their own kind of uh, private area they can stay in or facilities they can stay in, or you can camp. I got 12 acres up there in the Rockies and it's absolutely gorgeous. So those are our plans. That's why I'm doing all this. I'm, I'm busy getting our stuff organized and working with contractors and getting all this stuff, trying to sell some stuff, trying to get everything organized. So every penny and every minute of our time has gone toward doing this for the last several years. And uh, that's our goal. And without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do it and I wouldn't have even have a chance or a shot at doing it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Join me next week. Let's do pot printing with those wonderful collodion negatives we've talked about. And thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you next Saturday morning. Ciao.